Hi, I'm Nat Astrochat, and I have some exciting news. I have just taken delivery of some new Astro gear. Uh, it's a very big transition for me and a big upgrade, but I'm really excited to get started with it and to share with you what I've bought. So let's jump in. So first of all, the new camera. So at the moment, I am using the ASI 294MC Pro, which is a one-shot color camera. And I've decided after, I think it's about three years or so, that it's time to make the transition to mono. There are a lot of benefits to switching to mono, um, but there's also a lot of cost and pain and time that comes with that. So for me, the decision came down to a few things. RGB or one-shot color cameras are great, but they are they are kind of a jack of all trades, master of none. They work really well, they're very easy to use, very time efficient, you just put point and click um, and you've got all of your data across the spectrum of red, green, blue, um, which is fantastic. But for certain targets, depending on what you're shooting, so nebulas are, tend to be, um, they tend to be a good example of this where you may not wanna capture everything in that spectrum. So you wanna narrow down the wavelengths of light that you're capturing and just focus on capturing those specifically and ignoring everything else in and around it. So that's where narrow band, filtering come, uh, narrow band filters come into play. And uh, you can get narrow band filters which apply on top of one-shot color cameras. And I have been using uh, a Optolong l -Extreme, which is a multi-band pass filter uh, up until this point. And that's worked really well for filtering out some of the, the light pollution and other things that I don't care about. But the next step for me was to transition to mono and have very fine grain control over what it is that I'm capturing in terms of the data. But there's also another benefit with a mono camera, which is everything that hits the sensor is captured. So with an RGB camera, you've got a bare pattern which has been put onto the camera sensor. The idea is for everyday photography, you want to capture RGB and the world tends to have more green than any other color. So in reality, you've got a divided up grid which is split into red, green, and blue, but there's more green uh, capturing kind of wells within that, uh, within that array than any other color. So even though you're getting the, the data coming through or the, the uh, photons of light are hitting the sensor, depending which part of the sensor they hit, they may not actually register. Um, whereas with a mono camera, everything that passes through the filter and hits the sensor is being captured. So in theory, you're getting probably three times more data than you would otherwise. Now with that comes the trade-off, which is you obviously have to have, if you wanted to capture RGB, RGB, for example, you'd have to shoot once with a red filter, once with a green filter, once with a blue filter, and more likely than not, you're also gonna use a luminance filter as well. Um, and equally, if you want to focus on specific band passes, um, so the most common ones being uh, hydrogen alpha, oxygen three, and sulfur, um, sulfur two, then you can put those filters in front of the lens um, and or in front of the sensor, capture all of that data, and then you have to move on to the next thing. But it means doing three, or in that case, in that example, you need to do three different imaging sessions, uh, one after the next, and you need a filter wheel or some equivalent where you need to manually go and switch out the filters. So there's a lot more time and planning that's required to get the same amount of data but the quality of that data should be superior versus a one-shot color camera. And that's my rationale for moving across. So in terms of the camera itself, what I've gone for is the ASI 2600mm Pro. Um, I spent a while looking at the various different options out there, and I was on the, I was on the verge of going for the equivalent mono camera that I have to my one-shot color. So at the moment, I've got the ASI 294MC Pro, and there is an MM Pro equivalent but I decided I wanted to invest a little bit more money and go a little bit more uh, kind of up the, the ZWO spectrum of what they offer in terms of cameras. So that's where I landed on the 2600. In terms of comparison, so this camera has a higher resolution. Um, it's about, I think, 6,200 uh, 6, by 4,170-ish pixels. Um, compared with my existing camera, which I think is about 4,000 by 2,800. I'll put the exact numbers up on the screen. Um, this also has a lower read noise, um, which is great. And it's also got smaller pixels. Um, so it, I think these are 7.6, uh, sorry, 
3.76 versus the 294 MC Pro, which is about 4.63 nanometers uh, in terms of pixel size. Um, the other thing that this comes with is a marginally higher quantum efficiency of, I think, 75% in the MC Pro for the 294, and this will have 80%. And then another really attractive part um, or attractive element of this camera for me was the dynamic range. So my existing camera has a 14-bit dynamic range. Um, this takes me up to 16-bit, so there's more variation in that kind of spectrum of, um, of kind of light to dark uh, and the stops that go along that way. So all around a pretty big upgrade and a pretty expensive upgrade, but I'm hoping this will stand the test time and keep me very happy for a very long time. Now, obviously the camera alone is not enough to get going. I can't just use this in isolation. So I have bought some other things and this is why I say it was a big investment. So the obvious things that are needed are twofold. So filters, Need something to control them so i've gone for the zwo 36 mil filter wheel so this will hold seven filters so the thinking there is i will be able to put my lrgb filters in as well as um, ha sulfur and oxygen um, so I'll, I'll go through that later and probably put together a video of how to actually install the filters on this one i think it's a good topic it's a little bit daunting honestly i'm already um a little bit nervous about the cost of the filters and making sure they're put in properly the right way around, not getting fingerprints on them, not getting grease marks on them, all that kind of stuff. Um, and then obviously mounting the filter wheel itself to the camera. So I'll likely cover that in a separate video. And then the filters themselves. So this was a big part of the investment in this upgrade. Um, and I really didn't appreciate how expensive filters are. Uh, I didn't go to the top end of the scale um, in terms of what's available. So Chroma, Astrodon, they were just far beyond what I'm prepared to pay or even within budget for what I wanted to pay. Um, and I didn't want to go too low end. I kind of wanted, I've invested so, this much into the camera and into everything else. So I wanted to find something that was a good middle ground. And where I landed on that is Anthea. First of all, this set of LRGB filters. Um, so we've got luminance, I think, is in the gray box. We've got red filter, blue filter, and green filter, which I'm not going to unwrap these. Um, I, in a video where I install them into the filter wheel, I'll show you them, but I want to keep these sealed and protected. Um, certainly within their boxes, obviously I could take them out of this protective paper, but I'm not going to for now. Um, I do not want to risk getting any grease, dust, or anything else on there. So the only time these things are going to see the light of day is when they're being put into the filter wheel. And once they're in that filter wheel, they're going to be attached to the camera and they are going to be locked away so that nothing can get to them in terms of dust or otherwise. So they're the LRGB filters. I've also gone for the Antlio 36 mil filters for um, oxygen. Uh, actually, this is, so this is sulfur two. We've got oxygen three. And this is for hydrogen alpha. Um, so these are the three nanometer filters. I was actually looking at some of the other options that Antlia have and was on the fence between them, but these ones seem to be the ones that get consistently good reviews. Um, the only trepidation or hesitation I have around it is star halos. So I know that the O3 filter, some people get star halos, some people don't. Um, I think it kind of just depends on the batch you get and how lucky you are with it. So fingers crossed, these will not produce any halos. But once I actually am able to put everything together, assemble it, and get it out for a night of imaging, um, then I will share the results and we can see whether there are any halos. Hopefully this is a good batch, we'll see.
So first of all, um, what I did is a quick test at the beginning of the run just to see how the filters were, whether they were the right way in um, or the right way round within the filter wheel. But I also wanted to check for haloing, uh, particularly with the oxygen filter. So the first thing I've done is taken a picture of a very bright star. So I've got one for each. I've got sulfur, hydrogen alpha, and oxygen. So if we open up sulfur, and if I just do a quick stretch on this, so this looks good. Uh, the filter seems to be in the correct way around, as far as I can tell. And there's no obvious halo, which is which is a good sign. Um, I wasn't too worried about the soft one anyway, but that's good to see. This is a 60 second sub for hydrogen alpha, which is a similar situation. Again, no haloing really at all. Uh, a couple of star trails, but the guiding wasn't great at this time. And then O3, which was the one I was most concerned about. So if we do a quick stretch on this, and it looks pretty good. Um, so this is a 60 second exposure, like I say, uh, on Arcturus, uh, which is a bright, a bright star in the Northern Hemisphere. So this looks pretty promising. I'm pretty happy with this. Um, hopefully once I start using the camera a bit more, uh, I'll get a better sense of whether there are any halos at all, especially once I stack multiple exposures together. Um, but this seems like a good sign from the outset. So beyond that, what else have I done? So I, it's kind of galaxy season at the moment. Um, so I have actually captured some data with the LRGB filters. And the target I decided to go for is something I've shot a few times in the past, but haven't visited for a couple of years or so. Uh, and that is Bode's Galaxy or M81. So let's just quickly look at each of these. So we've got the luminance file, which I have stacked already um, and gone through all the processing. So this looks pretty good. Um, there's obviously a bit of a, a bit of a cast across here, uh, which I need to deal with. But overall, this image looks pretty promising. The detail looks good. Uh, in terms of the stars, they look pretty round. And there are some, there are a few kind of satellite trails coming through, which haven't fully been removed in terms of the artifacts that some are here are just crossing across. But I mean, like I say, this is a limited amount of data that I'm working with. But I think overall that that looks pretty good. Even in the corners, the stars look relatively round. Um, so I seem to have addressed the back focus issues and everything else, which is nice. Uh, and the filter seems to be performing well. So that's the luminance one. We've also got red, um, if we do a quick stretch on this. Uh, similar situation, looks pretty good. We've got green. And finally, blue. So overall, I'm pretty happy with these so far. Um, I'm going to go through and actually process all of the data. And I will share with you what the resulting image looks like. So as always, thanks for watching my videos. Um, I know it's only a small channel, but I really appreciate you tuning in. And if you enjoyed it, uh, can, please consider hitting the like button and subscribing. Otherwise, I will see you in the next video. And for the time being, here is my first light capture of Bode's Galaxy, or M81, with the ASI 2600mm Pro and my Antlia filters. Thanks for watching. See you next time. <laughs>